Radio V. Radio in TV. Radio in TV. He's absolutely Jason. He's absolutely gay. He'll absolutely brighten up the darkest rainy day. He's funny and loves movies. He's smart and he's a Jew. He's an actor and an activist and wants to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Absolutely Jason Stewart. And I am sort of thrilled and excited. And uh, this is what they call in the... uh, Radio TV biz is a get. I have writer, producer, director, Emmy winner, Writers Guild Award winner, and so many other awards. Jane Anderson, thank you. I've never been referred to as a get. Well, you are for me. Thank you for that. Now, I met you the first time for two seconds when you won the uh, Outfest Award. Yes. And and when you were with Tessie, your lovely wife. And then I met you again probably before that, when you did a play that I just love, which is called A Quality of Life, which I still think you should bring back. It should go to Broadway. It's one of the best written plays I've ever seen about life and death and and about people in their 50s, which I sort of really loved, which are not written about very often, about these two couples. And uh, I there's a talk back, and you were there. And I don't even know if I asked a question or started to cry. I don't remember (laughs) because I was so uh, moved by the play and by what it's about and about family, about fractured families. And so funny. And then I met you again by total coincidence. I had done a film with John Lithgow called Love is Strange. And he was on Broadway doing... um, the Alby play. The A Delicate Balance. A Delicate with Balance Glenn Glenn with Glenn Close. Yes. And I went, my, I was with my friend, a woman, who had to go to the ladies' room. And we were standing there. And you were waiting for Tessie, and I was waiting for my yes. girlfriend yes. at the time. And I, I thought, God, I know this woman. And I'm look, and I'm, of course, it's Jane Anderson. And we started, and we felt exactly the same way about the yes. play, and which does not surprise me because your sensibility of what you do is so mine. I mean, I feel like you're writing for me. I really do. It's really weird. I feel like you're writing for me. And I just saw your documentary that you did about your aunt. We'll talk about that first. Sure. It's called uh, um, Packed in a Trunk. Packed in a Trunk. And um, before we even start, I'm going to show, are we ready to show, can we show that clip of the trailer just to get people a little, uh, Jake, a little uh, touch of that, a little taste. A little into it. A little taste of it. He's looking like he doesn't know. For decades, I've felt a responsibility Mm -hmm. to Edith because she taught me how to paint. Her paintings were the backdrop of my childhood. I'm now the same age that Edith was when she was put away. And I've had the life that she should have had. It's time to give her story a better ending. To unravel the mystery of her lost life and return her work. Welcome to Provincetown. She's with all her friends. She's back with everybody. So this do- this is is this your first documentary? Yes, um, and it's actually directed by Michelle Boyner, who's done some really incredible uh, uh, short films and documentaries. That she has, um, I, please look her up. She did an incredible piece called "An Unfinished Life." In fact, oh my God! You should have I've her on the it. show. I would love to. And and um, when. I knew I had to get my great aunt's story out there. First, I made the website because, you know, how else do you get... So just to fill people in, she was a, a painter Yeah, um, at, my, at the turn my, of the century. Yeah, I had a... Um, here's a story. Please. My great aunt Edith was a uh, painter in Provincetown around 1915 to 1923. She <laughs> thrived there, did an incredible amount of work. Gifted painter, I would Very say. gifted. Yeah. And, the, and she lived with a woman named Fanny in New York City. And um, in 1923, she was put into an asylum, and she never, ever came out again. 
and all her worldly possessions, her paintings were packed into trunks and ended up in my aunt and uncle's attic in Wheeling, West Virginia. And when I was a kid, my mom, uh, who married into the family, was bored one day visiting the in-laws, right? And she said to my aunt, Betty, let's go up and see what you have. And they went into the attic. My mom opened the trunks, found these exquisite paintings, drawings, block prints, and she was she, the originator of the block print, which you later found out. Oh, one of the yeah, one of the originators kind. of the white line block print, right? Um, and my mom brought this work back with her to California, and I grew up surrounded by her work. It was hanging in your home. Hanging in my home. Uh, her work taught me how to be a painter. Mm. And um, as I grew up, I started to try to find out more about her because when, in those days, if you end up in an asylum, no one wants to talk about it. So I started uncovering it. And I realized I had a very parallel life. We were both gay. We were both painters. We had both left our homes to go to New York to find our way. I didn't know you were a painter. Yeah, I, I, I was a I painter heard that too. A, Not a, a pro. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a professional writer R now. But, um, Director also. Yes. But um, when I turned 58 a few years ago, I thought I have to finally do something about Edith. And um, that's when I created the website. And then going back to Michelle Boyner and her partner, Barbara Green, who's a cinematographer, Tess and I are their friends, have always admired their work. And we said, we have to, we need to make a doc. Are you willing to go along with us? Oh. Um, so I'm not the director of the doc. But still, there's it, it's you're obviously, it's your story, and it's so yes. through you. She's obviously a partner in this in such a big way and, and certainly saw the uh, parallels and the story of, of, you know, not just you, but so many other gay people and so many other women, not just gay women of that yes. period, who were put into insane asylums because they had a feeling. And uh, I'm assuming that some of it had to do with her being a lesbian. I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming. No doubt, no doubt. It's hard we have to no believe. proof about that. But yeah, no but it's doubt. hard to believe that it wouldn't, you know, because you go through such detail. And it's playing right now on HBO. Yes, Please yes. You can watch stream this. it, yes. Oh, you can stream it too on HBO Go too? Yes, oh, yes, wonderful. Yes, so it's in the yeah. uh, sections when you can go on demand. And yeah. I just, the minute it came, I saw, I, I just I couldn't believe it was you, number one, that you were doing a documentary. And that it was something that was so. I thought, well, it's going to be about this painter. And first, I thought, mm, okay, yeah, it'll be, painting, it'll be painting, interesting. Yeah. yeah, it'll be interesting because it's you. That's the reason I wanted to watch it. And then I was so moved, and I was so um, also frustrated. I have to say, and you know, you watch it, and you feel like, oh my God, you know what? Look what happened to people. Look what look what's going on in the world that's still going on now in certain ways. I mean with Black Lives Matter and so many things that are happening now about people who are just being disregarded and the equality of people is so uh, there's still still so much work to be done I think well that's why I felt because it's an important film my life is so um, privileged in that mm. I have all the freedoms that my great aunt should have had and that's the reason I felt I needed to um, make the film and get her work out there. I, you know, basically, it's a sad story with a happy ending. Are you thinking about making it as a, a film? No. Oh, God, I no, would love it. You know, well. I would love it. He, here's the thing about, um, as, as writers or artists or directors, when you have a piece of material, you decide what is the best form for it. When you have a story, some stories are best told in a novel, some stories are best told as a play, some are best as a film, some best as a doc. And um, I've always been very aware when I have a story to tell, what is the right form to tell it in, mm -hmm. where it will be the most effective. Um, with this particular piece, if you put it in film, it would probably be, you know, one of those nice indie pieces and mm -hmm. all the yes. things that happen. 
you, you say, oh, that's lovely, but when it's in a dock, docs say to the audience, this actually happened. Right. Which makes it all the more astounding. But I still, it's the kind of movie I would love because I just loved it. And now you're working on a piece, uh, and you haven't written that many pieces about gay people. No. No, uh, If These Walls Could Talk too, And, and uh, uh, Normal. Normal. But, uh, yeah, so you're writing, uh, which I think is sort of really, really exciting to see your point of view on this. So can, what can you tell us about what you're well, writing next? Because I'm excited. First of all, I'll, I'll make a confession that having... Um, grown up at a time when being gay was such an unspeakable unspeakable thing to be um, I did grow up quite closeted mm. and then as a creative artist even though I had come out and started to really openly live as a gay woman and, and Tess and I have had a long relationship um, I have still been hesitant to write directly on the subject. And that's, so a lot of my pieces are metaphors for being gay. Oh God, yes. Yes, so. Oh, I can see, I mean, that's uh, why I'm so uh, attracted to you as a writer. It, it, you know, I feel like I, it's almost like Tennessee Williams, in the same way that he wrote these characters. Yes, yes. And, because Blanche Dubois is a gay man of sorts. Uh, you know, uh, certainly, uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is it written about a gay man. Suddenly Last Summer is written about yes, a gay man. Yes, yes. Yeah, so this is going to be exciting. This is, in a sense, this next project. And you were saying that you were having a little writer's Well, um, first of all, this, the, the project is uh, Lily Tomlin and Jane Wagner. And the producer... Um, it's about them? No. They oh. came to me with this project. Oh, with idea. And Harriet Levy, who is uh, a big Broadway producer, bought the rights to a series of lesbian pulp novels from the 1950s called the Bebo Brinker oh Chronicles. Um, and they came to me and said, we'd like to make a film of this. And I um, started reading them. They're very, they're fabulous. They're very purple prose, very campy because it was written at that time. Um, and I started reading the, the modern, the contemporary introductions to the books by the woman, Ann Weldy, who wrote these. And she said that she uh, was actually married with children living in a suburb in Philadelphia uh. and living a very straight life. And she's... Um, uh, she, she was a beautiful Donna Reed, we very straight. We have to take straight. a little break, though. Sure. We, we'll take a break, but I'm going to call it right now. Lily Tomlin is going to have her biggest success in films in Grandma playing Oh, I saw that. It's fantastic. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm calling an Oscar nomination right now. We're going to be back in just a second with Jane Anderson talking about her new project right here on T Radio B on Absolutely Jason's Tour. Please stay with us. Don't change the channel. Oh, my God. We don't have a channel. <laughs> Hey, what's up? I'm Casey Abrams from American Idol. You're watching Absolutely Jason Stewart on T-Radio V. It's a good take, right? You sounded like you were completely like in a trance, like you were... Did, did you, you feel Did you feel it? Did yeah. you feel and the what, vibes? And what's with the focaccia hair? You don't you're, like you're it? You're a Jew, are you not? Yeah, well, yeah hey, your mother would be so upset. I, you shouldn't be taking... I know. Yeah, uh, look at, look at, everyone, look at the back of this hair. Dear God, get a brush. Get a brush. I'm Jason Stewart. We're on T Radio V. TV and the radio with the hair sticking out like some sort of homeless person. Listen, I'm sorry I have hair. All right, serious business okay, here. ready, guys? Serious ready? business. Radio voice, everybody. Okay, here we go. Let's just play. We should put music on and just dance for a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I have to stop and say one thing. I have to say it two words. Hey, 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 hey. Who shall join us and the rest of the T Radio V. Ready? Are we on? Give me some music. Watch this. Ready? Wait, are we rolling? No. Oh, is this real? Like, I was just totally is it kidding. Oh, let's start again. Start again. Say, say that. Okay, start again. Keep going. Start I could do real jazz. <laughs> do jazz hands. That was a shtick. I 
was doing a stick. Well, the hair different. is blonde, it's dye. Yeah, Just because you don't have any hair, and he doesn't have any hair, and I have all this fake right, start hair. Again, start again, start again. Fine. How's the hair and the I feel like I'm in a puzzle. <laughs> any show you can have, I can have better. Any show you can have, I can have better. Are we filming all this? Yep. That's awesome. <laughs> this is the good stuff. You're short and you know it. I know it was a lot of hodgepodge, but that's good, right? Yeah, hodgepodge is good intro, to cut. Let's do the intro one more time. So Menopause. So then my mother says to me, the whole point of your college education is to meet a nice boy. I just told her it was hard enough to meet a nice girl. <laughs> You girl, sure you're in the right place? Me and my friends are gay, you know. How can you like someone who dresses like a man? I thought you were a tough feminist. I thought you were just tough. Well, what do you think now? Why are you here? Is it your husband, too? My friend fell off a ladder. We think she had a stroke. Please, would you tell me if something's wrong? I'm so sorry. We say they passed away. Did she um, leave a will or anything saying that she wanted to give the house to you? No, no. You see, I don't think that it's fair that we should have to take care of somebody else's maiden aunt. Maybe we should adopt. Oh, yeah. Adoption agencies are always so open to alternative family adoptions. That's true. It'd be quicker if you got me pregnant. I hate that I can't get you pregnant. I can't believe you can order sperm over the internet. I guarantee you're getting the cream of the crop here. He's been married a really long time. His sperm will be really potent. You're going to be a great mom. I hope so. That was a little piece of um, If These Walls Could Talk too, which the first one was about women and having children uh, in wedlock, out of wedlock, if I remember correctly, that Cher produced, I think, oh, the first one? No, it was about um, abortion. Abortion, yeah. okay. And then this one was about gay, gay women. Gay women in three different eras. And, three, and, the and I chose to do the 1950s. Uh, with, with Vanessa the, Redgrave, who won the Emmy for yes. it. Yes, and, 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 and the, the late wonderful Marion Seldes, one of the great stage uh, actresses. Not just, uh, she's done some wonderful things yes. on film, but one of these people, you go, I know that gal. Yes. There was a, a doc done on her recently. Was it her? No, no, it was the other gal. I'm mixing her up, another character actress I love. A doc should be done on her. She was also a wonderful acting coach, I heard, too. And probably one of the most... Um, telling films about gay marriage before the gay marriage plight before started. Before it was even conceivable, yeah. Yeah, and about these two women who lived together for a million years, and when they when one passed away, what would happen to the other? Yes. I, I originally titled, titled it The Widow mm. because I wanted to explore what is it like if you're not recognized as a couple, but you've lived together your whole life and you've collected wonderful objects, things that you've given each other, and then the family of the person who died comes in and takes everything. What do you have left? And Vanessa Redgrave was um, magnificent oh. in it, just magnificent. And, and one of the... I had Jenny O'Hara on a couple of weeks ago. And Jenny O'Hara did Paul a Giamatti. beautiful... Elizabeth Perkins, yes. just an incredible cast. The only thing missing was me, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I just loved, I loved it so much. It was and just the way you showed that you have such a way of showing something without telling someone. You show them, you don't tell them. It's my favorite thing in movies, is you don't tell them what to think or, think or feel. You show them. Well, that's a, that's a rule of screenwriting or mm -hmm. playwriting or any kind of writing. You mm -hmm. You... You, you let the audience fill it in. And that really changed your career, I think, in a lot of ways, that one. I mean, it was such a big deal at the time. I mean, Ellen had just come out, and she had done the more contemporary one with Sharon Stone. And it was, it, I remember it was, it was uh, in our community, and also it being on HBO, it was, it was a groundbreaking uh, film at the time, I think. 
Did it change your career in any way for you? Um, my career was hopping along pretty well then. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but it, to me, what was more important was it was the first time I wrote something that directly was about being gay. Um, and the other thing was, as a director, getting to work with Vanessa Redgrave. What was that like? It, it was, um, Vanessa is an English stage actor. So when you work with someone of that caliber who comes from the theater, there is, a, there is no ego involved. Mm. Um, so you can just talk artist to artist, director to actor. And I, and I remember um, I, I would check in with her every morning while we were filming in the makeup trailer while she was just uh, getting worked up, um, getting her, her face made up. And a actually, she even asked the makeup people not to have any makeup at all. And they, and they said, well, let's just put a little bit. She has no vanity. None. And it's all about character for her. But I remember one morning I went in, I said, hi, Vanessa, how are you? She says, Jane, I had an idea. What if the daughter-in-law comes in and she wants the bed that Abby and I slept with in, and she has a tape measure to make sure that her mattress would fit on our frame. And oh. I said, oh my God, that's brilliant. Without saying anything about it? Just having her come she, in and... Yeah, and, and, and oh. so I, I just, I started grabbing everybody and I said to props, get us a tape measure from 1957 quick. And we talked to Elizabeth Perkins and we just put it in. That's the kind of collaboration as a director and writer I always hope for when I um. walk into a set. I mean, um, and that's, that's, that's the kind of caliber that, that uh, and Vanessa is. She's, she's just brilliant. She is a, a probably one of the most uh, real actresses, because in a sense she is a film actress also. She is. I mean, she's and such. She's she's so uh, uh, so real and so and so there and so present, and she understands what it is to go inside of your head when you get in close. Well, if you look at her work, uh, I, I remember when I I watched Julia. I think and, of this, and you yeah, think of the scene. And, and there was the a scene in the hospital when oh, when, hospital. when she's being visited, and her face, she's just been thrown down a stair case because as a radical she pissed people off so her character is in a hospital bed and she's being visited by Jane Fonda's character and you can see this raw look in Vanessa's face and you know it's not makeup because what I observed on set when Vanessa did one of the more emotional scenes her molecules actually change mm -hmm. Her work is so deep that you see her skin turn into the character. It's turn effortless. Into some, yeah. Yes, and very, very deep. Well, and you've worked with some incredible actresses and actors, and I, I, I go to if these walls could talk f from that to uh, I want to get the I don't the prize winner of Defiance, Ohio, starring Julianne Moore, uh, is one of my favorite movies. It's, it's a beautiful story about a woman whose husband is an alcoholic. It takes place in, in the... It's based on a, a, a wonderful memoir written by Terry Ryan, um, who wrote it about her mom. Also a lesbian woman, am I yes, correct? Yes. Uh, she was a wonderful... A little bit of a theme through your work. I, I suppose so, yes. Um, and she uh, wrote this um, memoir about her mom who, who had who was Catholic and had 10 kids. Her husband was an alcoholic. 10 children. Can ten you imagine kids. raising them basically by herself most of the well, time? Well, and her, because her husband was an alcoholic, even though Terry, what Terry did, she, she made sure that I had empathy for her dad because he was a broken man. 
Um, but her mom entered jingle contests, and this was in the 1950s, when you could use... Some people with jingles were in case they don't know, even remember anymore. Yeah, a jingle is, there's little a songs. contest, you write a little song, you write a poem, and her mom had, uh, she lived for words. So she basically fed, clothed, and sheltered her family with her wit. Winning prizes. Winning prizes. And she was also a woman who was perpetually joyful in this really difficult situation. And in the course of directing this film and being around Terry, and her family came and visited the set, and dropping into her mom's story, I learned something that I call Midwest Zen, which is there's something about the beautiful Midwest character, which comes from being a farmer and, and your, your crops might be destroyed by hail or locusts or bad weather or drought, but you keep getting back on the plow and going again. Can people see this film still now? Prize can, winner? Yeah. Oh, sure, you can let's get show it a little, on Netflix. Can we show a little sure. clip as we go to a break? Uh, let's show the trailer for it. I was, it's one of my favorite movies, and I want people to really be able to see it. And Juliana Moore, who an Oscar-winning actress mm -hmm. now, should have been nominated for this. That's all I have to say. And you should have been nominated for Best Director and Best uh, Screenplay at, at the time. And here we go. And we'll go into a break after this. Okay. The folks out there, they can win all kinds of big prizes. Write a two-line jingle starting, I'm glad I used dial. Is that what I won? Yes, ma'am. Bring it on in. In Defiance, Ohio. Mom! One remarkable housewife. Mom! What, honey? Raised 10 kids. On 25 words or less. Mrs. Ryan? Congratulations. You have won the grand prize. Oh, my goodness. Looks like you're the one who got lucky, Kelly. Guys at the shop, anytime you win something, it's, oh, we know who the breadwinner is. It's up to you to make him a good home. But I do. Well, you'll have to try a little harder. Enjoy it, Dad. Come on, Mom. You've been stuck in a house for 20 years, cooking and cleaning. We're out of milk. You could be having an interesting life. I do have an interesting life. Well, all right! Frisk the Frigidaire, clean the Copper's Bear Sandwich. That's a good one, Mom. You get to stay home writing in your stupid notebook. Those stupid notebooks are the only reason this family isn't living on the streets. Mrs. Ryan, you are our first prize winner. Mom, frisk the Frigidaire, clean the Copper's Bear Sandwich. Oh, baby. Oh, my gosh, Daddy. Mommy, want a shopping spree? Seven minutes to go, Mom. What are we looking for? Exotic things. Anything grown in a foreign country. Does Hawaii count? Yes. You know what your problem is? I don't. You're too damn happy. The taste and shimmer shake appeal. Jello jollies any meal. You've killed me. Death by Jello is highly unlikely. Hello? It's Defiance Home Saving and Loan. When were you going to tell me about the second mortgage? I just wanted for once to have a few extra dollars in my pocket. We're praying that you win something very big. All I want in this world is to make you happy. I don't need you to make me happy. I just need you to leave me alone when I am. Julianne Moore. <laughs> Woody Harrelson. And Laura Dern. Let me say one time. Oh. I don't know what to do with my hands. I mean, this is pretty much just like the same thing. Oh, wait, this is... No one wants to see her ninny goats. <sighs> like a bear. He's like a big bear, yeah. is he? Like, yeah. Let me... <coughs> Hold on, we'll start... You don't like the right pizza? Go f yourself. <laughs> you never know who should have shot Shin Chai Chai. Absolutely, I think that my show is better than yours. Yes, it is. No, it's, no, it's not. not. Yes, it is. No, no it's, it's not. Yes, it is. No, no it's not. not. The only thing that masks alcohol while you're driving is peanuts. Peanuts? peanuts? 
Peanut have to lots know. of when you're drinking. It wouldn't be the first time Langdon had Skippy in his mouth. Is that your dog? He radioed me. Get in the car. Walk on, walk on, walk on. Throw another log in the fire. It's not hot enough back here. T Radio V, radio and TV. Ay, ay, ay. Hi, I'm Frances Fisher, and you're watching Absolutely Jason Stewart on T Radio V. So it's T Radio in a V? Yeah, yeah. T Radio V. I've been TV six with radio. Months. That's okay. So in the between. TV goes inside the. In the no, thing the radio's it. inside the TV. And then, so it's both. Yeah. And that's my show. That's your show. And you just did my show. Yeah. Oh, God, I'm so excited. <laughs> I feel like we're crashing into a Titanic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, this is Danny Woodburn, and you're watching T Radio V. Did it come up? Are you right? There we go. He's good. Nashville next week. Hey everybody, welcome back to Absolute Jason Stewart. Uh, as you see, I'll be in Nashville next week on the 23rd, and Mentor will be in the Palm Springs Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, 3.30 on Saturday the 19th, and I'm going to be on a panel about uh, new media, and also the film, by total coincidence, the film Hush Up Sweet Charlotte, which is a parody on Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, with Varla Jean Merman, Mink Stoll, and myself will be uh, 7 p.m. that night at the same festival. Back here with uh, Jane Alexander, Emmy Anderson. winner. Anderson. Anderson. Uh, uh, Anderson. Right. Oh, my God. All the time. Does it? B yeah, both yeah. brilliant people. Yeah. Jane Anderson. How can I forget? And we're talking about, uh, you were telling us a story about Woody, uh, Woody Harrelson. You wanted to say something about Woody? Oh, yeah. yeah. Prize winner of Defiance, Ohio. Yeah, he, he was also wonderful to work with. Oh, man. Um, Great guy. And it's a very difficult part. Um, it's... It's hard to write a film and direct a film and for the actor to act in a film in which it's the part of the so-called bad husband. And um, You cast it well. He has this yeah, incredible charm about him as a human being. There has to be because I, I, I don't think there's any such thing as a bad husband or a bad man. Um, you see a lot of that trope in in a lot of films and um are you referring to donald trump haha <laughs> maybe uh but i i think it's really important if you're hit with a story that has a, a difficult marriage that you make sure that you, that even if your hero is with a bad partner a bad husband or bad wife you need to find the humanity in that person who's giving them grief. And that's why um, uh, having uh, Woody in that part was so essential because he knows how to, g he, he can play difficult human beings and, and show their humanity. So I, I, I go to this film, wonderful romantic comedy, It Could Happen to You. Yes. You were working on Facts of Life, Who's the Boss, uh, mm. Wonder Years before that? Not Who's the Boss. Uh, uh, or what is it? No. no, I. that was way, way, way. Facts of Life was my very, very, very first writing job. You did one little, I guess it says, episode. Y yeah. Uh, but you're so working on these, on these sitcoms, which is, and in those days, people didn't make the transition no. to film very easy. So how did you, and I'm, guess, I'm thinking the, the first big film was it could happen to you? Am I correct? Yes. Um, and that was a uh, big studio movie. It was a big when studio Nicolas Cage film. Nicholas Cage was yes. just like it. I mean, you must have been. How did that happen? Well, it's um, a great story. I I was never really built to be a uh, a writer on a on a comedy series, or you know, I I I've never been comfortable in the room. Because it requires a very certain kind of writer, which I respect, which is I call it gangbang writing. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you you have a script, you you know, everybody works on it together, and then you punch it up with jokes. Um, I I found the experience on Facts of Life 
really important because it taught me how not to be precious with my writing. Hmm. Because rewriting is everything. I had just come from New York. I came to the theater, you know, so I was, you know, had this notion that every word I wrote was very precious. And it was important for me to be on that show and do that kind of work so that I could write, throw it away, write, throw it away, and learn how to do many drafts, which is how you get to be a better writer and how you make a great screenplay or whatever. Um, I left the show after the Challenger blew up. I had oh, watched wow. the Challenger blow up uh, live while I was ironing my shirt to go to work on Facts of Life, and I was so deeply affected by it that I decided I had to write a play about it, which was my, uh, my play Defying Gravity. And uh. in the course of doing that, I realized that I needed to do, go back to doing work on my own, and that's when I wrote the spec script for It Could Happen to You, which then I, it, my title was um, Cop Gives Waitress Two Million Dollar Tip. Yes, I yeah, remember it. That was I the that original was, title. I yeah, love yeah. that title. Yeah, I remember that. It was that. too long for the studio. But I they still just love changed it. it. Oh, yeah, speaking yeah. of too lo long for this, uh, uh, the HBO film. The Positively film. True Adventures of the Alleged Texas Cheerleader Murdering Mom. Yeah, we're going to come yeah, back in yeah. a second. We're going to talk about working with Holly Hunter on that. And I want to, yeah, I want to I talk about the monologues. Sure. We'll be back in just a second after a quick break here on Absolutely Jason Stewart. Stay with us. Hi, this is Casey Abrams from American Idol, and you are watching T Radio V. That was too corny. I don't. I loved it. Brad is actually here right now. <laughs> I don't have the white disease. What's Whoa! <laughs> give, give me yeah. I want to see like some tiny intro. intro. Give me some boom. Yeah, give me it. some boom, bro. This is going to make us money. Ask Robert who his favorite celebrity animals are. Okay. <laughs> his animal lovers. All right, everybody, animal whip your <laughs> out. Everybody oh. whip it out. We'll be right back. See, now it's just... Let's do a couple things. Ready? Action. Or who oh, monsters. <laughs> monsters. You. <laughs> oh, that means me. Take it. It's God, your on the unreal mind. <laughs> to be honest with you, I like being down there a little more because my head was. <laughs> Candy corn monsters, boom! Hi, I'm Kristen Renton, and I don't know what I'm saying. We're just world, world animalists. Animal right? Here we go. Oh, I'll just. <gasps> I'm <laughs> real. On a real wall. <laughs> I mean, unless you fake it. I have contest on night calls and they were all peeing everywhere. Everyone's like, can I get another Diet Coke? Yeah. <laughs> we want to do more. Hi, I'm Valerie Landsberg and most people know me as Doris from the television series Fame. You're watching Absolutely Jason Stewart on T-Radio V. You're watching Jason Stewart on TV Radio V. Fame. Should we jump in there at the last one? And we're back here on Absolute Jason Stewart with uh, Jane Anderson. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about uh, Holly Hunter we were talking about during the break on, say the title so I don't mess it up. The Positively True Adventures of the Alleged Texas Cheerleader Murdering Mom. And uh, you won the Emmy for that. Yes, I did. You, did you go? Oh, yeah. What was the experience like? Oh, well. I sound like James Lipton. <laughs> what was the Emmy experience, darling? Well, here's the thing about award shows. Um, you have, I, I won that year. I've been to other shows where I've been nominated where you don't win. You have to understand that at the end of these award shows, whether it's the Oscars or the Emmys or the Tonys, three quarters of the audience is disappointed and pissed off because <laughs> they didn't win. Um, and uh, so you, you Was go- Was this your first nomination, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and you've so been nominated five other times. 
Uh, yeah, five other times. Five for, other times. For Emmys. Uh, I think just three other, three, four. I, I've lost, I, you know, I don't keep count. I do. Because I, <laughs> you can keep count. Um, You've been nominated six times for Emmys. Have I? Yeah. I don't oh, think so. Oh, I just so. love I, that. Yeah, but anyway, um, it's wonderful to win. It's just an absolute kick. But to me... I think uh, I I wish the go the Globes and the Emmys and the Oscars and the Writers Guild Awards I wish they would run it the way the Pulitzer Prize and the Nobel Prize and the Obies are, which is everybody decides beforehand to honor a group of people and you show up and you get honored. But mm. to make a bunch of creative souls sit in a room together and 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 go through the agony of who is declared best, I, I think is a very cruel thing to do. It's sort of crazy, yeah. It's crazy because there is no best. No. Every, every um, like I'm, uh, I'm nominated for Olive Kidridge and I'll be going to the Emmys on uh, Sunday. Sunday, which is fun because I have a fabulous dress um, who my costumer for the prize winner Defiance Ohio made me Yay! this dress. And it's, it's 1930s and cut on the bias and gorgeous. So you, you just get into that. But I have a feeling you're going to win. Well, whether I win or not, I just want to say I really love a lot, a lot of the work I'm up against. I'm up against Wolf Hall, which was just an exquisite piece. And American Crime, which I don't uh. know if a lot... which. I, I, I had uh, I, Penelope Ann Miller on the other day, and I know John Wrigley. And it's brilliantly it done mm. and very important. I think so. Um, but very similar to your piece in Olive Kittredge, because when I watched the first episode, I'm just watching this, and I love the way you don't care. You will just do. You're putting a story in. You're, you're telling it. Here are the pieces, and you better pay attention, because they're going to come back. And I love that. And you watch it, and I feel like I'm unwrapping a package. And the first episode is all like that. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff happens, and you never lose your sense of humor, ever. You know, ever lose your sense. I, I love the scene in Olive Kittredge when they're at the wedding. And she goes over to the guy, and she says, hey, you know, uh, the wind is coming up, and all this. You need to go out there and do that. And clean up your garbage. Exactly. Yeah. And it's so Maine, but it's also so Jewish. <laughs> My mother would do the same thing. She she would in the same way, and it shows how that we are so much alike in so many ways. And she would go, "You go out there, darling, because I'm paying for this." You know, she would say it a little differently, but she would do it, and she would make sure that guy did it. She probably watch him until she did it. And I love that kind of writing, and it shows in that scene to me how this woman felt so uncomfortable in her own skin, and 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 so uncomfortable in being with people that weren't like her. Well, you're also as good a writer as as your collaborators are. And Frances McDormand found, uh, <sighs> she discovered the novel Olive Kittredge before it got the Pulitzer. And she identified it as a really important piece of material. Oh, God, yeah. And then um, she brought me on the project as, as the writer and a co-producer. And, and with Richard uh, Jenkins, Jenkins, Bill Murray. Yes. Um, um, and Lisa Choldenko directed. Who directed. Um, and uh, if, uh, the Kids Are Alright. The Kids Are Alright. Right. Yeah, all the, the, you're yeah. like in a yeah. six degrees of everybody who you seem to work with is somebody from... Right. Yeah. But um, Fran... Um, was adamant about keeping her character unsentimental. You know, mm. she never wanted her character to break down and cry, which is always the you actor know, a thing. Lot of the actor thing. Um, and during the development of it, during the writing, she was a, a really important guide for the tone. What was your process with her as an actor in directing her? Uh, I didn't direct her. Oh, right, Lisa, Lisa did. In Lisa terms of directed writing it, her. Were you involved with that process at all? Well, as asked. as the writer, um, it was a very tricky thing. Because you're also a producer, right? Yeah. Uh, it was a very tricky thing to adapt because Olive Kittredge is a series of short stories. In fact, half of the short stories, if anybody has read it, you'll see that um, half of the short stories, Olive doesn't even appear in them. 
and they span, you know, 40 years of, of 40 years of her life. So I had to wrangle all of that, and and make it a a, a viable narrative in in these four episodes. So um, it took me a long time to solve it, and um, Fran and I would hang out together, talk it through, and just throw ideas out. Because I feel like, even though I said director, I'm thinking, why did I say that? It's because there's so much of your imprint on this film, I think. Even though Lisa's also another brilliant director. So not to take anything away from her, but you're certainly a part of this process in a really big way. I mean, I see your impressions, and I've, you know, I've watched your work, and I see it all through it. There's a certain line of... All of your women have this certain line in them. There's this, there's a vulnerability, but yet a strength at the same time. And that was what was so interesting about Frances in this, is that I felt like you could see the inside of her. And you didn't well, dislike Well, that's her. her acting also. That's yeah, Fran. Yeah, she's, she's brilliant. Fran is a, a but it's also, if, if it's not on the page, yes, you know. Yes, yes. It's very, you know, um, as an actor, she, I know. She kept my writing honest. I'm, I'm a pretty organic honest writer but but in first drafts you can't help but write crap right or, or you can't help but push an emotion you can't help but mm -hmm. you know because uh, you you're still finding you know, the voice and the tone and Fran would always steer me in the right direction and that's uh, you know that was she afraid of not making the character uh, vulnerable at all? Was she no, afraid? she was never afraid. She was just very clear. Uh -huh. She she's she has exquisite taste uh -huh. in material and. Um, but no insecurity about that about her the character looking. No, not really at all. She negative and not and one. No, note. she doesn't care. Again, like <sighs> Vanessa Redgrave, Fran doesn't have an ounce of vanity. Not at all. And and those are the actors that you really want to work with mm -hmm. De very much so let's show a little can we show a li like a minute or so of the of the trailer for Olive Kittredge and people can also watch that on HBO Go if you've not seen it you must see it and let's all watch you on the Emmys on Sunday what's depression it's this. bad wiring it makes your nerves raw it runs in our family your mother is not depressed yes I am no. happy to have it goes with being smart is that why you're so mean all the time absolutely died in December. Give me a reason to wake up in the morning. Don't have a clue. That's pretty harsh. It is not polite to stare. You look dead. Well, I'm not. Are you a witch? Yes. Now go away before I eat you up. Come take my hand. I just want to say one thing. Don't be scared of your hunger. If you're scared of your hunger, you're one more ninny just like everyone else. You're mine. I think our son's going to have a wonderful life. You married a woman who thinks she knows everything. So did I. <laughs> you have to believe we are magic. Nothing can stand. You had a normal, happy childhood, just for the record. You say these horrible things to me that make me want to crawl into a hole and die. Just admit that you were a horrible mother. I would have drowned if it weren't for Mrs. Kittredge. You were like my guardian angel or something. baffles me this world average people are happy are happy 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 you should try it sometime Molly. kind of too depressed I'll bring all your dreams for you. and we're back we got just one minute one left. minute left one minute left I wish you the best at the Emmys to have a great time thank I, you I don't know what to say thank you so much for being on my show and taking the time to be here it's just I've wanted to talk to you for so long. I still have pages of things to ask, you know. Oh, well. Someday, someday. And I have to go back and write. I have to go uh, I face the demons and open up a vein and let it pour on the keyboard. Is this for an HBO project? Where, where will it's, this it's, land? It's the one I was telling right. you about with Lily Tomlin. And it's yeah. going to be as a feature film in the theaters? Hopefully, hopefully. But I, I have to write it first. That's I, where it all begins. I can't imagine in anybody not wanting this. I mean, they, I, if anybody's listening, you should be the first one to bid on it. I don't care if it's written or not. <laughs> I'd buy it in a minute. 
Thank you so much for being on the show. A pleasure. Take Thank care. you, Jason. Everyone, take care. We'll talk to you next week. You are watching T Radio V. Radio MTV.